This is Vern Benham Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance Broadcast. Throughout the world, December the 25th is celebrated as the anniversary of the birth of Christ. Although the scriptures did not give an exact date, and later there was no general agreement, the date was finally established in 35 A.D. by the Christians of Rome, Italy. The selection of December 25th was due in part to the fact that it coincided with the greatest pagan festival celebrating the winter solstice. Sun worship was an important part of the religions of the ancient races, and the followers of Christ decided not to compete with pagan festival dates, but rather to follow the strategy of incorporating them into their own religion. The extravagant orgies of ancient Rome were held at the time of the Saturnalia in Germany, Scandinavia, and England. There was a December festival in honor of what they called the God of the Golden Sunshine, observed by dances, feasting, and religious rites. In Scandinavia, it was called the time of Yule. Through symbolism, the transition to the current observance was an easy one, celebrating the birth of Christ as the sunlight of the spiritual world, drawing pagans away from their previous heathen sun worship. And the joy of Christmas is universal. Bells are rung when princes are born, and they toll a dirge when heroes pass. All nations have their festivals and their holidays, but the whole world seems to stand still and pause a moment in reverence before this Jesus of Nazareth. As Shakespeare said, so hallowed, so gracious is the time. There seems to be a universal awareness of the fact that peace on earth can come only from goodwill among men. So simple a truth it is, and yet so difficult for the human mind to learn. That it is only with a new attitude within the heart, within the mind, peace within the personality, of the individual human being, love within the personality, within the mind, within the context of the thinking, the attitudes, the heart of the individual. Only from this can a transformed world ever come. Dr. Leslie Weatherhead once wrote of Jesus, he could make a child feel at home on his knee, but he could make his powerful enemies quail before him. He said that by him men would be judged, but he was meek and lowly in heart. He said the most awful things about sin that have ever been spoken, but he said the kindest things to sinners that human ears have ever heard. He asks from me my all, and yet he gives himself to me utterly. He is Jesus of Nazareth, the Prince of Peace whose peace of heart and soul can even now emerge within your life. You can find God and know God, not just find out about God and know about God, but to the satisfaction of your soul, you can discover firsthand, personally, the very God who brought this universe to be and the spark of whose spirit indwells your mortal mind. The old philosopher Erasmus wrote, By a carpenter mankind was made, and only by that carpenter can mankind be remade. Said Jesus, you must be born again. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world, but loses his own soul? In Northern California, underneath the chapel window, over at Stanford University. There's a depiction of the boy Jesus in the carpenter's shop in Nazareth. And beneath it, this inscription, the highest service may be prepared for and done in the humblest surroundings, in silence and waiting in obscure, unnoticed offices, in years of uneventful, unrecorded duties. The Son of God grew and waxed strong. Jesus increased, we read in the scriptures, in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Not only physically and intellectually did he grow, but spiritually. The most vital aspect of your life is the spiritual. There was a poet who has written, The carpenter of Galilee comes down the street again. In every land, in every age, he still is building men. On Christmas Eve, we hear him knock 
He goes from door to door. Are any workmen out of work? The carpenter needs more. That carpenter needs more workers to build the kingdom of God upon this earth. He once said, the fields are white for the harvest. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Will you be among those in this day, in this hour, to give your life to the living God who gave you your life in the first place? Said Jesus, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. The Galilean has been too great for our small hearts, were the words which historian H.G. Wells used to sum up the influence of Jesus upon human history in his book, An Outline of History. Napoleon once said to General Bertrand, I know men, and I tell you that Jesus Christ is no mere man. Between him and every other person in the world, there is no possible term of comparison. Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and I founded empires, said Napoleon. But on what did we rest the creations of our genius? Upon force, the might of arms. Jesus Christ founded his empire upon love, and at this hour millions of men would die for him. End of quote from Napoleon Bonaparte. The author Charles Lamb once said, if Shakespeare should come into this room, we would all rise, but if Jesus Christ should come in, we would all kneel. The English playwright and Nobel Prize winner George Bernard Shaw has written, I'm no more of a Christian than Pilate was, or you are, gentle hearer, and yet, like Pilate, I greatly prefer Jesus of Nazareth. And I'm ready to admit that I see no way out of this world's misery but the way which would have been found by his will. By his will, said Jesus, pray. God, it is my will that yours be done. Your will be done. Your kingdom come, your will be done. It was a desire to accomplish the purposes of God upon this planet which was preeminent in the mind and the heart of Jesus of Nazareth. It is not difficult to see one vital significance of Jesus Christ. He has given us the most glorious interpretation of life's meaning that the sons of men have ever had, wrote Harry Emerson Fosdick, the fatherhood of God, the friendship of the Spirit, the sovereignty of righteousness, the law of love, the glory of service, the coming of the kingdom, the eternal hope. There never was, wrote Fosdick, an interpretation of life to compare with that. Never has there been in all of human history a view upon human existence such as was taught by this Jesus of Nazareth. Claim it for your own. Dare to believe you are a son or daughter of the living God. That God has a plan for this planet and a purpose for your life. And that you can discover the satisfactions of service, the joys of the Spirit. Jesus said, I have come that my joy might be in you and your joy might be complete. Jesus came not to get men into heaven, but to get heaven into men, wrote E. Stanley Jones. And Jesus came not to get men out of hell, but to get all of the hell out of men, wrote Jones. It's the transformation of the inner life, which was at the very heart of what Jesus taught. The poet Matthew Arnold once wrote, Try all the ways to peace and welfare you can think of, and you will find that there is no way that brings you to it except the way of Jesus. But this way really does bring you to it. You know, the inscription over on the eastern entrance of Rockefeller Center in New York City reads in these words, quote, Man's ultimate destiny depends not on whether he can learn new lessons or make new discoveries and conquests, but upon his acceptance of the lesson taught him close upon 2,000 years ago. End of quote. And that's a reference to the lesson of the life and the teachings of this Jesus of Nazareth, 
who came proclaiming a spiritual renaissance. The kingdom of God is within you, said Jesus. There's a true story, and this came out of a certain country where the government attempted to suppress religion. According to this story, one night, the state police broke into a small meeting of religious worshipers, and an officer began to take down all of the names of those who were in attendance. When he had told the people that they must await their summons to appear in court, he started to leave. But there is one name that you haven't got. One old man called out. The officer checked his list. Finding that all present were accounted for, he asked whose name was not on his list of those gathered together in that room. The living God, the old man called out. He too, he too is here. The author F.W. Borum tells the story of an old Scotsman who, when he was very ill, was visited by his minister, and as the minister sat down on a chair near the bedside, he noticed on the other side of the bed there was another chair placed at such an angle as to suggest that a visitor had just left it. The minister glanced at the chair and said, I see I'm not your first visitor. But the old Scotsman looked up in surprise. The minister pointed to the chair. The sufferer said, I'll tell you about the chair. He said, years ago I found it impossible to pray. I often fell asleep on my knees. I was so tired, and if I kept awake, I could not control my thoughts from wandering. But one day I was so worried, I spoke to a minister of religion about it, and he told me not to worry about kneeling down to pray. He said, just sit down, and then put a chair opposite you. Imagine, in your mind, that Jesus is sitting in that chair, and just talk to him as you would talk to a friend. And then the Scotsman added, and I've been doing it ever since. So now you know why the chair is standing like that. A week later, the daughter of the old Scot drove up to the minister's house, knocked at his door. She was shown to the study, and when the minister came in, she could hardly restrain herself. My father died in the night, she sobbed. I had no idea death could be so near. I'd just gone to lie down for an hour or two. He seemed to be sleeping so comfortably. And when I went back, he was dead. He hadn't moved since I saw him, except that his hand was out on the empty chair at the side of his bed. Yours, too, may be a fellowship with the Spirit of the living God, a fellowship which will sustain you in death as in life. If you will dare to believe the gospel, the good news, this Jesus of Nazareth, 2,000 years ago, proclaimed. If you're interested in these topics, write to us. We want to hear from you at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644. That's the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, or abbreviated SRI. For those of you listening in other countries around the world, over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell the meaning address, SRI, Box 3080, Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, United States of America. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Seven Principles of Prayer, Life After Death, What Does Happen When You Die? If you're interested in these topics, no cost, no charge, no obligation, nobody's going to come to your door with an attache case and try to sell you something, simply write to the Spiritual Renaissance Institute Box, 3080 Oakhurst, California, 93644, USA. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, May God's will be done by you. Good day.